And now we'll go to the first panel of the day. Uh, I will, uh, maybe we should, uh, we'll have uh, Knut uh, Orbach Nielsen, who is the CEO of DMVGL, to make the keynote introduction to the panel. Maybe we should have the panelists take their seats and, uh, so Joshua is going to uh, moderate the panel. And we have uh, Fred Kenny, he's here. I see everybody's coming up. So, Knut, the, uh, the floor is yours. And then, of course, you can be part of the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here to say, have the possibility to give a few remarks ahead of the, the panel discussion with so many uh, distinguished panelists. So I'm, I'm very honored to be able to give a few introductory remarks. So this morning I would like to say that uh, the shipping industry, the maritime industry, is really in a period of significant transformation. So I would like to, to draw a parallel to geology. And I would say there are three tectonic shifts happening in shipping these days. And uh, you know tectonic shifts are when the earth plates are colliding. Uh, the shifts that I'm talking about is in particular on the market. The markets are becoming increasingly volatile, unpredictable. The second significant shift is really around regulations. We've seen the introduction of quite a number of significant regulations uh, over the past few years. We're in the middle these days uh, on the sulfur cap, but maybe what is more on everybody's mind uh, going forward is the uh, tremendous ambitious goals around CO2 uh, reduction. So there are significant challenges on the regu regulatory side and then the third tectonic shift is really centered around technologies. And uh, we have for some uh, years already talked a lot about digitalization and uh, in many ways it has been a buzzword. Uh, maybe everyone is talking about it but maybe not everyone is doing as much. But I would say that digitalization is really one of the enablers for a more efficient uh, operation of shipping in the years to come. Um, Coming back to the uh, regulatory side, this also triggers quite a lot of new uh, technologies and I'm quite sure that you are all very much engaged on the scrubber discussions these days. Now scrubber, the scrubber discussion has at least three dimensions. It's naturally a, a scientific one, uh, whether it does what it is intended to do, whether it pollutes the air and the oceans, but it's certainly also very much a commercial discussion. It's a discussion about whether you will have the uh, differenti uh, differentiate in, um, in, in fees, uh, whether you will be able to make, uh, say, a, a quicker return uh, on, the, on the money invested on the scrubber installations or not. And it is certainly also a very much a political one. So we see quite a lot of uh, different port states uh, banning the use of open loop scrubbers and uh, we can see that the political sentiment amongst especially the younger generation is very much on the green side of things. So there are uh, these three tectonic shifts I think will not only influence the maritime and the shipping industries over the next few years, but we will maybe see this influencing shipping over the next few decades. Just to give you a couple of uh, uh, figures to keep in mind, um, we at DNVGL are following the uptake of scrubber technology quite uh, carefully. We get the numbers from most of the manufacturers and uh, you know the number of manufacturers on scrubbers are increasing tremendously. Uh, the latest figure uh, that we have on, on scrubber uptake is 3,750. 
So you can say that it is picking up quite significantly, although if you com compare that to the world fleet, you will still see that it's a, relatively speaking, it's a sort of a niche application. But it is indeed quite important for some of the bigger uh, vessels. It's also interesting to follow the technology uh, side on the fuel choices of the future. And uh, if you look to LNG or gas as fuel, uh, the number excluding the uh, gas carriers, we are now at 350 vessels using gas as fuel. So this is gradually picking up. I would say it's been quite a slow uptake over the last 20 years or so, but we do see now uh, an accelerated interest, especially on the liner side in the container uh, sector. And then finally, just a couple of remarks around the batteries. Electrification is certainly one of the, say, important technologies for the future, especially so for short sea shipping. And it's quite remarkable in the last two years, the uptake on battery technologies is the same as we've had in the last 20 years on gas as fuel. So it's around 350 vessels installed with batteries as the main uh, source of energy. So uh, coming back to the tectonic shift, so markets, regulation and technology, and it's certainly going to impact us a, a great deal going forward. And I would like to just end on a very important note, and that is representing uh, a company, an institution, a foundation that really is there to safeguard life at sea. We really have to make sure that in all these changes, we always keep safety at the core of everything that we do. And I'm sure that we can have some discussions about whether we have managed to do that with some of the recent regulations. My argument is that we have let ourselves go too much in the direction of environmental protection and we have, in some cases, jeopardized safety in order to meet that demand. I'm not saying that we shouldn't meet the environmental concerns, but we have to make sure that whatever we do, we keep safety very much at the core. And there are no vessels that can be lost, and there are no lives that should be lost at sea. So with those uh, few introductory remarks, I think I would hand it over to you, Joshua, and, and please lead us through the panel discussions. And thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for the, your attention this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Newt. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Newt. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you to Capital Inc. for uh, inviting uh, us to uh, speak on this panel this morning. Uh, my name is, uh, is Joshua Apfelroth. I'm a partner in the law firm Kedwalder, Wickersham and Taft based in New York City. Um, we advise a number of shipping companies uh, and investment banks uh, in connection with mergers and acquisitions, um, corporate governance, financing transactions, and other transactional matters. Um, I'd like to introduce our uh, very impressive group of panelists this morning. Uh, to my immediate right is Frederick Kenny, Director of Legal and External Affairs at the IMO. Um, in order, uh, Lars uh, Robert Peterson, Deputy, Deputy Secretary General of BIMCO. Uh, Mark O'Neill, uh, uh, President of Columbia Ship Management. And Francis Richardson, the CEO of Bermuda Shipping and Maritime Authority. Um, so, so the topic of this panel is game changers and the future of the uh, shipping industry, obviously a very broad uh, topic. I hosted the same panel last year, and, and I think um, we, I would describe the, the, the feeling as you know, cautious optimism. Uh, there was optimism in the sense that uh, charter rates had uh, been improving, stock prices had been recovering, a number of uh, shipping companies uh, had returned to profitability. Um, however, on the flip side, you know, I think we remained cautious in the sense that um, you know, we were faced with a you know, potential impending you know, trade war, um, which is only exacerbated over time. Um, the, the overhang of uh, a no-deal Brexit, which I know has been in the news lately, um, and uh, another number of other uncertainties around uh, geopolitical tensions and a narrowing of financing sources. 
Um, I think at that time we, we had all wished that we had a crystal ball to look a year into the future and, and hopefully gain a little more clarity. Um, but in hindsight, you know, even if we had that crystal ball, uh, not much more clarity would have been gained as you know, we're faced with you know, many of the same issues that uh, we were faced with then. Um, so with that, I think you know, initially we'd like to give our panelists you know, a few minutes each to discuss um, the, uh, the issues and the opportunities that they see in their you know, respective industries as you know, we have a very diverse group of panelists and I think uh, we would see a very diverse group of perspectives uh, in, in the sense of what uh, issues uh, they, they're faced with and they view as particularly important for the industry. So Fred, maybe I could start with you. Okay, thanks very much, Joshua, and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think you're going to be asking some more specific questions of us uh, in a minute, so I will, uh, I will hold some of my remarks on specific regulations and, uh, and initiatives at the IMO and start off with a more general comment. Uh, really, the goal of the IMO uh, as the global regulator of uh, the shipping industry is to provide uh, a global set of regulations uh, that are universally implemented and consistently enforced. The goal is to create a level playing field for the industry, no matter what the subject is, be it the 2020 sulfur cap, be it GHG uh, emission reduction, uh, you know, be it the, the uh, oncoming uh, issue of uh, maritime autonomous surface ships. Uh, and there are th challenges to that when we have regional or unilateral action, when we have inconsistent application and enforcement of the regulations. So we have a long way to go. The good news is, is I think the IMO is responding uh, to those challenges uh, when you look at uh, all the work that has been done to prepare for the implementation of the 2020 uh, sulfur uh, limit regulation on January 1st. When you look at the really encouraging results we're seeing from the IMO member state audit scheme, which has actually triggered a lot of activity in the flag states, in the port states, uh, to consistently and, and better implement the IMO treaty regime. I think we're moving forward towards that level playing field, with going back to what Newt was saying in terms of the, the market recovery, uh, a uniform regulatory foundation uh, for the industry can only help Lars. Thank you, thank you, Joshua. Uh, and coming from the industry side of, of the business, uh, representing, I think, uh, more than 50% of, of the global fleet, uh, we at BIMCO, of course, share many of the, you could say, purposes and, and uh, ideas that IMO is built on, namely uh, maintaining free access to market, free trade, uh, that everyone have an equal opportunity to play the markets. And, and in this respect, a lot of the industry is built upon a compliance regime, really. You comply to a global set of regulation, you know what the regulations are, and you, uh, you, you spend the money uh, necessary to uh, comply uh, with these regulations. Everybody do it on an equal basis. Um, and, and this brings us to what are the biggest opportunities and risks facing the industry. Um, as, as we uh, speak, and that's probably that some of the new regulations, they're not so clear-cut in terms of what does compliance means, how do we do it, um, and that means both a risk to your business, because if you choose the wrong solutions, you could uh, end up not being in the business anymore if, uh, if it really comes to the, to the far side of the matter. On the other hand, there are also great opportunities in choosing the right uh, solutions. I think on the solver, uh, debate uh, that goes on at the moment. The, the way to comply with the 2020 regime uh, is definitely a risk uh, to the industry because it is not clear what we have to do. On the other hand, IMO is also, uh, as been said many times, uh, trying to uh, fathom the uh, climate change uh, agenda. Um, and that, on the other hand, poses a huge opportunity to the industry. Um, what, of course, remains to be seen and for everyone to remember is to, to be around when those opportunities uh, actually emerges uh, some decades ahead uh, of us. Um, 
so, so with that, I think we'll uh, discuss the, the finer details later in the panel. Um, being able to comply and knowing uh, what to do is, uh, uh, is a very important uh, part of being in the shipping industry. And, and one thing that we should not forget in IMO, talking about goal-based uh, regulations and, and, and these kinds, we still need to understand what it means and how we get there to be compliant. Thank you. <clears throat> Morning, everybody. Um, I just wanted to make five quick points. Uh, the first one was Axel talked about the adventure um, when he gave his talk about L London Stock Exchange, how insurers used to meet round the corners and partake in the risk of the maritime adventure and coming at this as a lawyer or an ex-lawyer, most of the early cases, the contractual cases under English law, concern maritime voyages and the maritime adventure. I'm still amazed at this in this day and age that the adventure still exists. It is still a huge risk. It is still um, uh, an adventure as far as the gain at the end of the whole process is concerned and I think we have the technology and the sophistication to take out those market fluctuations and take out that uh, adventurous element in our industry which really has no place anymore uh, in this day and age. Second point is people. I think uh, the focus of the last two years wrongly has been on digitalization. Uh, and the, how digitalization will transform this, this industry. Yes, digitalization is uh, a means to an end, but it's not the end itself. And people, our people, uh, are what matter, and the training of those people, and the opportunities that we give those people, women and men, and all people from all diverse backgrounds. And I think as an industry, we need to focus ever more uh, on that too, including the sophistication of our human resource uh, input and efforts where our industry is woefully behind uh, other industries in career progression, career planning and equal opportunity. So I think people is, is at the heart of our business and will remain at the heart of our business going forward. Third point is I, I, I'm always amazed uh, that this industry almost bemoans regulation and regulatory change that uh, is foisted upon it. Um, uh, but I think we all need to engage in, manage, and embrace the opportunities of regulation. We're probably the least regulated of the logistic industries. If you compare shipping with aviation, far more international regulation applies to aviation than it does to shipping. The difference is shipping, uh, aviation speaks with one voice in the context of that, that regulation, uh, manages the process, the regulation process, and then embraces it. And I think we need to do much, much more as a business, as, a, as an industry sector, to um, really engage in and manage the change. If we take IMO 2020, how many of us are sitting here bemoaning uh, IMO 2020 and all of the hassle that it's causing us from the start of next year, when actually this has been flagged up for the last 12, 13 years, and what the problem is, is we never engage sufficiently at the outset of that and, and, and manage the process and perhaps made the whole regulation more balanced uh, in, 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 in our favor as well as in, in favor of the environmental question. Uh, the fourth point is optimization. We're seeing more and more drive towards optimization. This is where I do believe, I do agree with Knut that digitalization, uh, if digitalization is a means to an end, the end is optimization and we as an industry are ever more optimizing the various sectors that we're in, the various processes to get to deliver better value for money, greater efficiencies, greater economies of scale, uh, greater data management. So optimization will go forward and uh, indeed in line uh, with other industries. And the final point is quality. You know, I'm, and we are amazed at the discrepancy uh, between the quality of operators still out there. And I think as an industry, we really do need to raise the standards uh, across the board uh, uh, of the quality of our operations. And that ties in with regulation. So I, I personally feel probably coming at this as a lawyer and therefore a little bit biased uh, would suggest that we ought to embrace, manage, engage in regulation, but encourage more regulation, not less regulation, uh, to the extent that it actually raises the quality of the industry uh, as a whole in a balanced way. Thank you. Good morning. 
Good morning. Um, it's, it's certainly my pleasure to be here today and to participate um, with this panel discussion. And the year 2019 represents a very significant year for Bermuda because we are actually celebrating 230 years as a ship registry. Um, I would just like to make a, a few initial comments on what we consider to be some of the biggest opportunities and risks sort of facing us as administrators. And based on the comments and feedback that we've received from our clients, it is my view that most owners and ship management companies have the will and desire to operate well-maintained ships and safe ships that comply with international conventions and our national legislation. Therefore, I think this represents a real opportunity to enhance the relationship between the owners and the flag administrations with the common goal of working towards full compliance. And conversely, um, compliance also represents a certain level of risk and apprehension for owners in addition to the financial impact associated with the cost of procuring equipment, components, logistical requirements, and the resources to manage it all. Um, the Bermuda Ship Registry has always prided itself on its high standards of operations and flag performance as a jurisdiction. And, and Bermuda as an as a insurance center is also renowned for and have a good track record for compliance and good governance. So I feel as a jurisdiction, we generally have the opportunity to provide a suite of services to the shipping industry. And certainly, from a, from a commercial standpoint, one area that Bermuda has a lot of experience in is the operation of passenger ships. And in this sector, we've seen a large, <coughs> unprecedented growth with, I believe currently there's approximately 125 ships in one order with 39 different companies. So we really see this as an opportunity for growth in our segment. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you, thank you, everyone. That's um, I think gives a good perspective as to what you know the, the concerns of and, and and opportunities that our panelists uh, see in the current environment. Um, Lars, maybe I'll maybe I'll start with you. Um, you mentioned I think a lot of around clarity of the regulations and the need for um, the need for clarity um, in in the enforcement of the regulations and in how you know companies and ship owners uh, should be. Uh, thinking about complying with those regulations, you know, I know one specific example is you know open loop versus closed loop scrubbers, um, where you know a number of ship comp shipping companies have you know in installed open loop scrubbers, um, which have you know since come under you know regulation from local local governments. Um, can you give us some specific s examples of what you you view as is needed as far as clarity goes? You know while touching on the open loop versus closed loop scrubber debate. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, I believe the, the main issue operating scrubbers is about operating them on the high seas, uh, not so much in port and in estuaries and you say in territorial waters of, of nation states, uh, which is actually where we see the, uh, uh, the, the issues at the moment with, with local governments, uh, states banning or putting in place uh, uh, various restrictions for open loop scrubber uh, restrictions. The important thing is that this is on the agenda at IMO uh, to deal with uh, the wash water effluent, um, and that is a, a piece of work that we follow very uh, uh, closely uh, because it is important. Ship owners have invested a large amount of uh, capital in, in these devices, and they have been approved according to a set of guidelines for use uh, at the high sea, um, and we need to ensure that those capital investments at least are not stranded. Uh, so, so this is the important thing. Whether it is possible to use it in a port uh, here and there, I think is uh, probably the, the least uh, concern at the moment. Thank you. Um, Fred, um, I guess I'll give you a, a chance to, to respond. I guess the question being, you know, how, how is the IMO thinking about the you know, open loop uh, scrubber issue uh, and what steps, you know, I know that it's currently under consideration, what steps does the IMO uh, intend on taking uh, going forward to, in consideration of that? Well, thanks. Uh, 
the opportunity. It's, um, <clears throat> I think it's important to recognize exactly what the IMO is doing uh, so as not to cause any alarm in the industry with respect to it. The MEPC at its last uh, session in May approved an output to, uh, to undertake a review of the guidelines and, uh, on that Lars Robert was just mentioning uh, with respect to open loop scrubbers. Uh, it has sent that to the Pollution Prevention and Response Subcommittee, which will meet in January of this year. Uh, and their tasking is to initially is to just look at the output that has been approved and see if that needs to be refined. Uh, and then go back to the MEPC with a report on that. They'll do some more work, I think, as well, in terms of reviewing the guidelines and determining what might need to be done, ultimately to be decided by the committee. But it's very clear that what the member states and the MEPC are trying to do is to take a very careful uh, review of the guidelines. I, I don't think anything is going to be done in haste here. Uh, and the other point I would make in response to one of the comments that Lars Robert just made about uh, assets being stranded. Uh, it, never in the history of the IMO has the IMO banned a piece of equipment. Uh, it's always been grandfathered in, and uh, it would be a, certainly a first if something like that were to happen here. Uh, and indeed, both Marpole and Solus have provisions that almost require grandfathering. Thanks, Brad. Um, so uh, I mean, let's talk a little bit about enforcement, um, Mark. I, I guess um, what uh, have, have you and, and your, your clients been, been seeing, and, and what are their concerns regarding you know, the ability of you know, port states, uh, flag states, the IMO, uh, in, in enfor you know, to enforce these regulations on a, on a level playing field? Look, I think uh, all of us involved in operational management have uh, always enforcement on, on our mind and, and compliance by our vessels, our own operated vessels or, or, or managed vessels. Um, I, I think with the, the greater influence of sanctions uh, in the business, uh, we're all now much more uh, attuned to managing uh, this risk and, and, and compliance and certainly from our point of view we've been helped considerably through our latest development the performance optimization control room which monitors all our vessels and has a traffic light system where it appears uh, a particular vessel is potentially about to engage in in a, in a sanctioned voyage and, and that then demands a, a conversation with uh, the client or sometimes if the client has chartered the vessel with, uh, uh, with the charterers. So I think uh, as operators now, as managers, all of us have complicated, complex systems in place to ensure, um, ensure compliance. Um, I have to say, yesterday I was at uh, the inter-manager uh, conference and uh, a good friend of mine, Roberto Giorgio, said, look, I think managers ought to speak more with one voice to influence um, uh, regulation, um, sanction compliance, the effect of uh, sanctions more. And I, I probably rather rudely rounded on him and said, look, it's not our job. Our job is to manage uh, vessels. And there is another forum, or there should be another forum for that. And that's really the, the genesis of my comment this morning, that there needs to be a voice in this industry. But having slept on it overnight, I apologize to Roberto. He's probably not here. But I do think there is uh, a need for all, all of us to engage more and educate uh, both the ITF, the, 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 the port state controls, uh, sanctions, OFAC, as to the implications of some of these uh, rules and regulations on our day-to-day -day, day -day lives. It was very, very telling um, when um, Hill Dickinson law firm gave an account of a recent uh, OFAC SDN 
uh, application against uh, a tanker owner recently, it's been, it's been well publicized, OFAC had no idea about shipping. No idea, didn't know what a charter party was, didn't know what a bill of lading was, didn't ha have a clue about different vessel types. There needs to be a voice, and there needs to be a, a voice lobbying. And I don't think IMO is, the function of IMO is that voice, in, 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 in fairness to IMO. And we've seen that with IMO 2020. Everyone says, well, what's IMO doing about it? It's not IMO's job to do that. It's for us as a, as a body, as a collective. Uh, and, you know, we would certainly throw our weight behind any, uh, whatever weight that is, or any efforts to create that single voice uh, in some of these regulations. But coming back to your question, I think we're all, we all deal with these regulations as best we're able, but it's, it's on the back foot. We're not engaging sufficiently. We're not proactive enough in, in, uh, in the process. Thanks. And I guess, Francis, maybe uh, just piggybacking off that, what's um, your view from kind of the flag state Bermuda perspective as to the, you know, the optimal way, you know, to ensure that these, you know, new regulations and, and future regulations are enforced uh, equally and fairly? Well, certainly as an industry regulator, the Bermuda Ship Registry has a very important role and responsibility to work very, very closely with the ship owners and management companies to help identify and mitigate any what I would consider to be transitional issues related to compliance, whether it be with the um, new sulfur requirements or any other regulation that is um, in place. And this, from a, from a flag perspective, includes providing a very clear and consistent approach, providing the proper guidance, standardized forms, and of course having the resources to assist our clients as required. And when it comes to the enforcement, um, Bermuda, unlike many of the other flags, um, generally we don't delegate the um, ISM, ISPS, and the MLC audits. These audits are undertaken by surveyors <coughs> within, within our organization. So this really provides a good opportunity for us when we're on board to really take a close look at the procedures and processes that, that the operators have in place. And, and often, as the case, we would provide guidance where we feel there's some, some gaps that need to be addressed. Um, so I think generally it's a case from a flag perspective of having that open dialogue with our clients and constant communication and working with them and not taking a, a punitive approach but certainly working with them to assist them in, in their efforts to comply. Thank you. Um, so switching gears a little bit, uh, Newt, um, you, you mentioned in your speech, uh, you know, that, that, you know, your view is that we're focused a little bit too much on environmental uh, regulation, perhaps at the expense of, you know, safety. Um, can, can you expand a little bit as to how um, how those two, two are inconsistent and where, you know, you think we're falling short on the, on the safety front at the um, behest of, uh, you know, focusing too much on, on environmental regulation? Yes, um, thank you for asking that question. Um, it may sound a bit provocative to say that we are too focused on environmental issues. Naturally, this is something that needs to be done, and I think that the IMO is doing a great job. Uh, setting the agenda uh, towards 2050. My point is that uh, it's rather complicated to make good regulations and uh, in some cases we've seen that in the best interest of protecting the environment uh, we have introduced some uh, especially technical challenges that impact safe operation of the vessels. Just to give you one example without being too uh, technical. so. For instance, the derating of engines is naturally something which is very good for the, uh, say, reduction of emissions. However, when you derate an engine, it means also that it will take the vessel longer time to go through what is known as the, the, the critical barred speed range. That period when the vessel is spending in that time introduces quite a lot of vibrations to the propeller shaft and the steering arrangements. And the fact is that that introduces some really critical failure modes that we haven't seen before in many of the ships. And that is 
one very concrete example where the environmental topic has really led us into, say, a new era where we are, say, letting go of some of the safety concerns. And that is why I say that the role of making these regulations going forward is so important that we always keep safety at the core while we are addressing these uh, environmental concerns. So that is just one example. I could mention quite a number of others, but I think for the interest of the audience that is uh, sufficient. Thank you. Uh, and, and Fred, um, do you share a concern or, or what, I guess, is your view as to um, how IMO should be thinking about you know, safety as it also considers you know, re regulation uh, from an environmental perspective? And, and does, it, does IMO already consider that um, as, a, as, a, as a factor? Well, this is something that the Secretary General speaks about um, very frequently is that uh, you know, while environmental regulations are really at the top of the agenda, at least in the public eye uh, at IMO, uh, we, cannot, we cannot neglect or forget the, the critical safety work uh, that needs to continue and also needs to continue, as Knut said, um, in conjunction with uh, the environmental regulations. And if you look at, for example, uh, the Maritime Safety Committee looking at the 2020 uh, sulfur limit regulations from a safety perspective, you can see that that system does work. And, and those, uh, those considerations, the safety considerations of the implementation of 2020 uh, have certainly been taken into account and will continue to be taken into account as the regulation is implemented. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, so, so Mark, I, you, know, you mentioned in your initial comments um, that the, the, the industry should welcome regulation um, and that, you know, we should speak with one voice and, uh, you know, not to put words in your mouth, but almost that it should take more efforts to regulate themselves uh, and, and embrace, you know, embrace a culture of regulatory compliance. Um, you know, recently, um, the, uh, I think something called the Poseidon Principles was, uh, was issued, were issued um, where, you know, a number of, uh, very influential banks um, have, you know, have uh, committed to uh, ensuring transparency in uh, their loan portfolios with respect to uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, in your view, is, is that, you know, a step in the right direction, um, you know, where, you know, in addition to the IMO, at least, you know, there's, there's a private sector, uh, there's a private sector commitment to um, ensuring uh, you know, environmental compliance and environmental um, sustainability, uh, and is that um, something that you expect to see you know, moving forward? Look, there's no doubt um, banks, funds, in investors play their part in, in our industry. You only have to look at some of the Norwegian banks that brought in green recycling clauses into their finance documents. All of a sudden, everybody, everybody's attention was um, at the grave end of a, a vessel's lifespan, not just at the, uh, the, uh, the, the launching and the, and the trading of the vessel through its, through its life. Um, so yes, I think banks, funds, investors, and other uh, oil majors, et cetera, play their part, but I think we need to play our own part. And, and I think, um, uh, well, I've said enough about that at the, at the beginning, but we do need to speak with one voice, and we need to find a body to speak with one voice, and we can't keep looking at the IMO and saying, well, what are you going to do to help us? Why haven't you thought of this? We have to be clear as to the IMO's function, and, and it's, it's raison d'etre, which, uh, which is not that. Um, but, uh, yes, certainly, um, I think uh, all of these influences are, are welcome, but we have to manage the process. We can't suddenly... Uh, be faced with a situation as we are, as we are now with IMO 2020, scratching our heads and saying, "Well, you know, what's going to happen?" We shouldn't be in this situation. We shouldn't be uh, four months from um, the, the, the new regulations coming in force, wondering what is going to be happen. We should be better prepared. And I think you know the classification societies and and, and some of these other bodies need to be telling us. And they are, in fairness, they are. Well, what are the implications going forward? But there is a sense of still a sense of uh, uh, uncertainty, no doubt. Um, 
Lars, from your perspective and from the ship owners and, and Dimco's perspective, is, is this, um, you know, I'm speaking to the, specifically about the Poseidon principles, but generally speaking, um, kind of a focus on self-regulation uh, or, or industry regulation outside of, you know, IMO uh, regulation. Is that a uh, step in the right direction from, from the ship owner's perspective? Do you have any concerns uh, about that? There is certainly a role for some self-regulation in this industry, but I also think there is a limit to what we can do. This is a global industry, uh, and there is a reason why IMO was established in the first place, because countries around the world, they, they made their own rules for their own ships, and when ships sailed around the world, they encountered all kinds of problems because of this. That's the very reason why we have IMO, and this central function of making one set of rules for everyone to, to stick to is important. Um, and, you know, looking at this industry with so many players in so many different countries around the world, uh, thinking that we, as an industry, can unite and make our own regulation is probably uh, a bit naive, um, um, because th there is simply a, a level playing field issue that this industry thrives on. Uh, and if we do not ensure that everyone sticks to the rules that we decide, then they won't work. Then we don't have any rules. So um, there is a tradition that the, the rules come from the outside, from IMO, from maybe the banks, uh, in the case of the uh, Poseidon principles. But again, the Poseidon principles in this case is a subset of, of the finance industry that have united to, to establish a set of rules. Um, you can, of course, always argue whether those rules are fair and square and whether they will work, uh, fulfill the purpose, and, and you can even discuss what is the purpose uh, of the rules uh, in the first place. Um, we think it's important that when you make something, take an uh, outset in a, in, a, in a data set, you should remember uh, for what these data have been collected in the first place and trying to use a data set or a purpose for which they were not collected in a completely different direction may actually have some unintended consequences, uh, and, and, uh, and I think I'll leave it with that. Um, there is uh, some role for self-regulation, but I think there's certainly also a very much a limit uh, for self-regulation in this industry. Thank you. Joshua, could I just make an additional comment, please? Of course. Yeah. So um, I would just like to, to emphasize um, what Lars is saying, you know, that the role of the IMO is so uh, vital for the international uh, shipping and maritime industry. Uh, having so many different uh, port states, uh, so many different uh, national schemes and, and regulatory bodies, it would be an in, in almost impossible puzzle of regulations if it did not have the IMO to set international standards. So really, um, we have seen there's been quite a lot of pressure uh, on the IMO uh, over the last few years, and, and especially the EU has been very, very active. But it's so important that we get international regulations. And I think one of the challenges with the shipping industry is naturally that it is so incredibly fragmented. There are so many different players. And without the IMO to set, say, the same level playing field for everyone, uh, we risk really uh, to take away uh, the neurosystem of global trade, which is the shipping industry. So that is just to emphasize the role of the IMO, the, the importance of, of making uh, the IMO regulations the best there is and also to avoid regional or, or national regulations. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, just, just to add on to, to the last two comments, the, the thing that's really important to recognize is that the IMO is not a private club. Uh, it, is, uh, it is designed to be uh, a body where the member states can communicate and cooperate. And what a different country might say at the IMO depends on the information they receive informing their views. And uh, industry participation in the development of member state views is really critical. Uh, and and that, 
includes participation at the meetings themselves. I was at a, um, I was at a, a conference yesterday regarding uh, the, the ship port interface. And one of the things that became clear is that the ports are not adequately represented at the IMO. Uh, they could be if they had more people on the delegations or they had more people communicating with the member state delegations uh, to express their groups or through their, uh, their uh, industry groups that also have consultative status. So the opportunity is clearly there. It's a matter of making sure that the views get heard. And that, that was my point, actually, not that the IMO is uh, in some way defunct or, or not performing properly. It's just that a lot of people in the, the maritime sector view the IMO as kind of their lobbyist, their representative on, on maritime matters. And, and it's, it's an ignorance in all of us. It's not there for that purpose. And that's why I think we, we as a collective body, need to engage more with the IMO, with our, also with our national uh, shipping um, representatives in, in governments, and, and actually try and influence it so that we don't have this um, IMO 2020 where a lot of people are saying, why weren't the practical aspects thought of better, thought through better? Why, when you have an asset value, when you have an asset with a 20-year lifespan, and suddenly this, this, this regulation comes in that radically alters the financial viability of that, why, why wasn't that contemplated and accommodated? Uh, we, we have ourselves to blame, and, and we, we need to work better with the IMO, but recognize what the IMO actually is there for, I think. I sometimes perceive in things I read in the media or some comments I, I hear that the IMO is this nebulous thing uh, that people can't get the arm, their arms around, but in reality, the IMO is all of us, and uh, uh, it's what you make of it that's important. Yeah, so, so I guess in that vein, um, Fred, just sticking with you, um, so what's next? I, I guess, um, you know, we all know that there's been a focus on you know, greenhouse gases, there's this, you know, 50% reduction uh, target by 2050. Um, that's a long ways away. Um, what is in the near term uh, kind of a focus on uh, uh, of, of IMO and, and making sure that we stay on on plan to, uh, to hit that target? Um, yep. Thanks. Uh, well, I think there's a tremendous amount of activity going on, and, and that um, I think that focus uh, on the, uh, the implementation of the initial strategy for, uh, for GHD uh, production and eventual elimination, because you know, people talk about the 50% reduction goal in 2050, but the second part of that goal is total elimination by the end of the uh, century. Uh, and when you look at uh, the, the council in July, approved uh, additional uh, intersessional working groups for uh, the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Working Group, the MEPC. Uh, the, uh, I think that is the, that will be the dominant item on their agenda. Uh, and um, uh, as we head towards the development of the, the final strategy in 2023, there is clearly a lot of work to be done. The, the, the appropriate measures to be implemented still need to be decided. Uh, of certainly a lot of proposals are coming out on the table now uh, that are receiving consideration, but uh, clearly there's a lot of work to be done. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, so moving away, I guess, from environmental issues, um, Francis, uh, do, do you, um, you know, obviously we're, we're in the midst of a, a global trade war, um, and uh, so I guess my, my question is how, how do you view you know, tariffs, international tariffs, uh, trade sanctions as uh, impacting uh, the shipping industry, um, and what do, you, what do you see as kind of the best and worst case scenario uh, coming out of that? Well, certainly um, there, there will be some impact, and our role as, as an administrator is, is to ensure that the vessels that fly our flag um, comply, so we we have systems in-house where we can identify where our ships are at all times and in the event we feel that a ship is trading in a region where there may be some issues, then we certainly will reach out to them. But I think in a, in a general sense, I think the whole industry will be, will be impacted.
buy it, and it, it, it's a case of, of um, I guess, the agreements that are that are that are made between the owners and and particularly the charters. So it's certainly one, an issue that we're keeping a close eye on as a regulator. But we we certainly feel we have the processes in place to to manage it as as best as we can. Thank you. And and Newt, um, can you, um, how do you how are your clients? You're thinking about tariffs and, and the effect of, um, you know, potentially increased tariffs or, you know, the potential cessation of a trade war on, on their businesses. Well, I think there's general concern um, just based on the fact that it, it, it will naturally have an impact on their operations. And, again, it depends on what their operations involve. Um, and certainly if, if, if they are in a situation where they're in a charter agreement, then it certainly could be impacted by it. Um, so I, I just think, in general, it's, it's a concern for everyone that's in the industry. Thanks. Um, can you, uh, can you, do you have any, any additional views on that? No, I think this is um, it's making the whole international trade quite complex when you have uh, tariffs and sanctions and, and all these, uh, say, uh, politically introduced uh, measures. So uh, I guess mo most of our clients would be really happy to see that the world uh, normalize and that we could uh, resolve some of the bigger uh, issues, especially between the U.S. and, and China, and, um, and that we could, say, move on to a more, say, uh, stable uh, market. Thank you. Um, so, um, Look, I, I guess, you know, right now we're, we're in a weird kind of state, right? There's, you know, charter rates are up, um, Baltic Dry Index is up, uh, but we, there's still kind of a lack of investor, you know, confidence, stock prices are fairly depressed. Um, how, uh, Lars, maybe, you know, maybe this, is, this is good for you, H how um, sustainable do you think the, you know, charter rates, um, you know, being what they are uh, is, um, in the face of you know these challenges, and you know to what I guess do you attribute the the um, disconnect between uh, valuations of you know publicly traded companies and uh, the performance of the charter markets? Uh, <clears throat> Maybe valuation is not triggered so directly from the from the uh, what you say peaks and tropes uh, of the charter market. Uh, than actually being a general look at what are the current fleet on the sea, what is the demand, what is the demand growth that we expect, um, and, and how does this balance out in, 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 into the future. And this is probably the real reason why we see this uh, present disconnect, because yes, there is an, an, an upside at the moment in the market. We don't know how long that will uh, remain. The fact is there is still uh, a lot of uh, tonnage on this, uh, uh, floating around uh, with the, as we just discussed, uh, the outlook for demand, uh, not least because of trade wars and general depression in, in the world economy, not looking so great. Uh, and, and, and we see very much that this is the reason for the, uh, for the disconnect. Mm -hmm. and, and Mark, do, do you view, I, I guess, the improved Charter rates as, as sustainable, or something that your clients are, are concerned about is, um, you know, temporary, or you know, a, a, at least uh, s subject to uh, some of these contingencies or conditions that you know are, are fairly uncertain at the time. I, I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer that question. I I, I think clients are always concerned by fluctuations, and and you know that's one of the volatility is. Uh, uh, an ever-present threat in our business, isn't it? So I, I, but I, I don't have a view on, on, on the markets and how stable they'll be going forward. Okay. Um, well, I don't want to. Yeah, time's up. So I don't want to uh, out, outlast our, our time here. So, uh, but thank you so much uh, to uh, all of our panelists. Again, thank you to Capital Link for the opportunity to uh, host this panel. It's been uh, very informative and uh, appreciate it.